Welcome to Dog Save the People, a podcast about how dogs make our lives better. My name is John Bartlett, and I'm your host. Ellen Furlong helped found the Dog Cognition Research Group at Yale University as a postdoctoral fellow. Today, she is an associate professor of psychology at Illinois Wesleyan University, where she also directs the IWU Dog Scientists, a research group exploring cognition in dogs. Recently, she published an audible original book, Decoding Dogs Inside the Canine Mind, that gives an in-depth look into the psychology of our furry companions. Ellen, welcome to Dog Save the People. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now, where are we speaking to you from? I am in normal Illinois at the moment. Normal? It's about halfway between St. Louis and Chicago. Oh, uh, okay. So I'm from the I'm from Cincinnati, so I definitely oh, get the okay. Midwestern yeah. life approach. It's a wonderful, wonderful place to be. It is. So Ellen, tell me a little bit about your background. I know that you've been working in academia, but can you give me sort of a, a career trajectory as to wh- how it brought you to where you are today, please? I started training dogs when I was about eight. Uh, we had a little terrier, Coco, who I, who I started working with then. Right. You know, I spent every free minute that I had with my dogs. We got a second dog when I was about 12 or 13, a Cocker Spaniel um, named Sassy. Uh, if I wasn't working with one dog, I was working with the other. Wow. <laughs> it was so surprising to me how totally different those two dogs were from each other. You know, they were raised in the same house. They, you know, had a lot of the same experiences, but they were wildly different. Sassy, the Cocker Spaniel would do anything to please me. She just wanted to make me happy. Coco, the terrier had a mind of her own. (laughs) (laughs) Only if I made it worth her while, Uh would she she be excited about doing training with me. (laughs) So it was really fun to really adapt my training styles to what they needed and think about how to motivate them and get them excited about doing things that I was excited about. What an amazing experience to have grown up with that and to have really witnessed these diverse motivations from your own family dogs. It was really great. I mean, I remember being on vacation with my family when I was, I don't know, probably 14, 15, something like that. And everybody was at the pool and I was sitting by the pool with a notebook and writing down all the questions I had about dogs. Uh huh. That's incredible. That's what you were brought on this earth to do. In college, I took a little bit of a detour. Um, I had been working with dogs all up until uh, I went to college. And in college, I started working with uh, non-human primates. Yes. After I finished my PhD, I did a three-year postdoc at Yale uh, with Lori Santos. And while I was working with Lori, uh, we started the dog cognition lab there to study dogs. Uh, Dogs had been used in psychology research for a long time. I mean, you can think back to like Pavlov and his ringing of the bell and the dog salivating, (laughs) but they had been used more as, as models to understand how psychology works in general and less as, you know, a species that's interesting in and of their own right. And so we started that lab up. We just started doing some pretty basic uh, work out at dog daycares. Um, So we would travel out to a dog daycare, do some studies that we had done before with monkeys, just to sort of see if we can use the same methods with dogs. Then I came here to Illinois Wesleyan, where I've been since 2013. Um, I started my own dog cognition lab here, and we've been exploring all kinds of aspects of how dogs think and make decisions and interact with each other. Now, Ellen, you have uh, one dog, Cleo, and do you have, actually, do you have two dogs now? We have two dogs, yes. We have Cleo and Charlie. So now I know that Cleo um, is involved in your work somehow. Can you tell me a little bit about that, please? Yeah. So both of them actually have been involved in my work uh, a fair amount. Uh Typically, we do every study that we run in my lab. um, We run with my dogs first. The reason for this is, is multifold, but one of them is we're never going to do anything in my lab that I wouldn't do with my dogs. So that's right. a promise I can give to all of my participants that, you know, we're not doing anything unethical. I love my dogs yes. more than anything. <laughs> yes. And um, and so we're not doing anything that will harm them. We also do the studies with both of my dogs first because they are sort of at different extremes of the kinds of dogs that we get in our lab. Cleo is very smart and very interested in uh, subverting our expectations. <laughs> so if there's a way for her to creatively come up with a way to destroy our apparatus, you know, undermine all of the study that we have, she'll figure it out. I love it. 
And Charlie is a little timid, so he's on the other end of the spectrum. Um, and so if we have a study that involves dogs interacting with an object or something, we want to make sure it's an object that dogs feel comfortable interacting with. If Charlie will interact with it, so will most dogs. So we have these, these good dogs on two ends of the spectrum. And the final reason they participate in all of our studies is because they're really good at helping to train my students on how to do work with dogs. Again, Cleo is very willful. Yeah. She does not, you know, she's like, you're not my mom. Um, I don't have to listen to you. <laughs> and so she will do her own thing and does not particularly care what she's being asked to do by the students. Right. Uh, but Charlie is a good boy. And if they tell him to sit, he uh. will sit. And if they can handle both of them, then they're ready to handle most dogs that will come in the lab. Now, talk to me about smell, because I know, obviously, uh, smell is an enormous aspect of a dog's uh, experience here on Earth and very different from us. But I know that this is a big part of your focus as well. Dogs are so much better at smelling than we are. It can be really hard to conceptualize, but I like to talk about it like this. So do- a dog's sense of smell is so good that if, if this were odor instead of taste, if we took a teaspoon of sugar and put it in two Olympic-sized swimming pools, they could detect that. Wow. I mean, and if you think about what we can do, it's like nothing close no. to that. Like maybe <laughs> we'll detect it in a cup of coffee. Right. You know, certainly not in anything like one swimming pool, much less two. Wow. Um, so they have amazing. an incredible sense of smell. The whole world of the dog is about smell. Yeah. For dogs, smell is the most important sense that they have. You know, if you think about the senses that we humans tend to rely on, we really rely a lot on on our vision and on our hearing. You know, we don't really pay all that much attention to smell. Yeah. But for dogs, it's exactly the opposite. They don't have great vision. You know, they're not really using their vision. Their hearing is pretty good. It's a little better than ours. But their sense of smell is just outstanding. They have organs in their nose specifically dedicated to smelling. We have the same organs, but we just don't use them. (laughs) They're not, they're just like our appendix, right? It's just there. It's not doing anything. They also have way more sensory neurons than we do for detecting odors. They have way more epithelium, or that's the tissue inside of the nose for trapping odors. And they have this really cool recess in their nose called the olfactory recess, where they can sniff information in, um, and it gets into that recess and it gets trapped there. What happens with us is we breathe information in, we breathe in scents, um, and then we breathe them right back out. So they only stay in our nose for a really short period of time. So for dogs, they're able to actually trap that air inside their nose so that it has a longer time to sort of connect with the sensory receptors in there and make it into their uh, perception. And the kinds of things they can do with their sense of smell is just amazing. I mean, just with my own two dogs, they have no training at all in any scent detection. But every time Cleo has an ear infection, we know, not because of Cleo's behavior, but because Charlie's sniffing her ear. Mm. He's never been wrong. Um, He's never missed an ear infection that she had, and he didn't alert. He's never alerted that there's an ear infection when there hasn't been one. Um, He is 100% correct. (laughs) And so just the kinds of things that they're doing without any training um, is pretty amazing. So everybody's dog has this amazing sense of smell. Um, And everybody's dog, I think this is one of those cases where we can think about what research and dog cognition and behavior can tell us about what we owe them. We owe them the opportunity to use their sniffers. I think that a lot of times people think that what dogs need is exercise and that exercise is the most important thing we can give them when we take them for a walk. And, you know, Cleo in her heyday, she needed so much exercise that I started running marathons just to give her the amount of exercise that she (laughs) needed. (laughs) But, and and sure, they do need exercise, but they also need the opportunity to get out there and smell the world around them. That's how they learn information about the world. That's how they know about their neighbors. That's how they know what's going on in their neighborhood. We have a fox that lives in the woods behind our house. So we go out um, every evening after the fox has been through and they just uh, walk around and sniff and follow the fox's trail, right? It's really, it's really enriching for them. It's giving them a lot of exciting input that it's more exciting than the kinds of things that we can give them (laughs) Um, is this opportunity to smell is just 
crucial for their happiness. And you describe them as sniffy walks. Sniffy walks. Yes, exactly. So yeah, the, some people call them a sniffari. <laughs> Lots of different terms. But... Oh, I love that. And it's interesting. I always think about the dog when I'm, whether I'm in the city or in the country, I always feel like they're, especially in the city, they're sniffing and sniffing. I feel like they're picking up their messages. Yeah. And I had one guest that had mentioned the fact that, you know, rather than getting impatient, as mm-hmm. some of us can do when we're out with our dogs, just let them, if they want to stand there and sniff a spot for 10 minutes, just let them do it. Yeah. Definitely. And I think that that seems to be very much in line with what you're um, what you're speaking about now. Definitely. And that's good for them. It's good for us, too. I mean, we we are, I know, at least for me, I'm a type A, go, go, go person. Yes. And so being sort of, you know, told, stop and stand here yes. is a powerful thing for me as well. It's a sort of a way for me to let my shoulders down a little yes. bit and um, just breathe and get a little centered. I know. Yeah, it's so true, Ellen. And I try to remind myself with that because I have three different dogs. They all like to do different types of walks. Mm -hmm. But one in particular, I take on a walk and a lot of times he would just stop in his tracks. And it just it really forces me, but in a beautiful way, just to stop. Mm -hmm. And dogs, of course, animals in general, they have so much to teach us. Yeah. So, Ellen, you recently came out with an audio original book. Uh, decoding dogs inside the canine mind. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So, um, so that's a book that I did in partnership with audible and with the great courses. The book is really about dog evolution. So where did dogs come from? Um, uh, they came from a species of canid that looks something like the gray wolf as we know it today, but we don't know exactly when that happened, when domestication happened or why, dogs became domesticated or where? (laughs) So we have all kinds of questions about dog domestication. So I talk about that in the first couple chapters. And then uh, most of the rest of the book is really about dog behavior and about dog cognition. So how dogs think. And a lot of it is about what they think about us as social partners. um, Mm. And as does your dog really love you? I saw you had Clive Wynn on. So, you know, the answer to that is yes. Yes. (laughs) Um, And, um, and it's, it was a lot of fun uh, to work on. Oh, I bet. Now, if you take yourself back to that younger teenager who was sitting by the pool, writing down the notes, yeah. Um, do you feel like you've been able to answer some of those or are they still some of the questions that are that are swirling around in your mind? Yeah. You know, I had a lot of questions about what dogs think about us. And I do think that we have answered a lot of those questions. Um, but of course, we still have more questions to answer. Oh, I love it yeah. so much. It's wonderful to be able to really work with dogs on a day to day basis and spend so much of my time learning more about them. I think that anybody who has dogs or lives with dogs or near dogs or, you know, is curious about dogs really can benefit from learning more about how they think and um, the kinds of reasons why they behave in the ways that they do. And so I would encourage anybody who is interested to learn more about it. I think understanding your dog more can help you be a better, you know, guardian to your dog and can help you make sure that your dog is living their best life. And when I talk to dog owners, that's the thing that they're most concerned about. You know, they say, I say to them, if you could ask your dog one thing, what would it be? And they say, are you happy? Um, Mm. Is there anything I could do for you that I'm not doing for you? And so I think learning more about dog cognition and, and, and understanding their behavior is the best way that any of us can go about making sure that our dogs are happy and that the answer is you're doing everything you can. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah. (laughs) Now, how has your experience changed during the pandemic working from home? Oh, I have loved working from home. (laughs) I know that's not a universal uh, feeling, but I have loved it. And one of the major reasons that I have loved it so much is that I do get to spend all of my day 